a little bit about the discovery and how it came about. So this is a ship that we, uh, our team has been looking for for about 20 years. Uh, Captain Eric Takajian, who is a noted shipwreck hunter in Massachusetts, uh, first mentioned the ship to us, first discovered it in uh, the early 2000s and searched for it in the late 2000s. In 2016, my partner Joe Mazrani and I sort of picked up that search and collaborated with Eric, uh, who we've collaborated with on a number of projects, and have spent the last eight years really looking for the ship in earnest. So uh, we spent about five years collecting research, about two years scanning the ocean floor, looking for anomalies in the area we thought it might be, and then finally we're able to dive some targets this year and identify one as Lelene. Incredible. For someone like myself, who's like a layman about that, I mean, you're trying to find a, a ship that uh, in a vast ocean. So how, what kind of research do you do? And when you send, when you say that you were looking for abnormalities, do you send like a, a, a machine down or divers? To, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, the shipwreck hunting really is looking for needles in haystacks. Yeah. The ocean is a really big haystack. So what we do is first amass as much research as we can about the possible location of a ship. And with a ship that sank in 1856, that's very difficult because historical records are limited. And even the way navigation was measured during that time is much less precise than it is today. But we spend the time, we amass the research, we get a general area of where the ship might be. Then we take a side scan sonar out to the area and tow it behind the boat and scan what's on the ocean floor. It's We call it mowing the lawn. Wow. We spend 16 to 18 hours a day just towing a sonar back and forth, back and forth, hoping to pick up abnormalities or anomalies on the ocean floor. Uh, and then from there, we analyze that data to see what looks like it may match the ship that we're looking for. And then eventually we would go back out and dive those targets. Are there um, cameras on that sonar or no? There, it, it's it's a it's making a record, but they're acoustic images. So they're okay. images that are created by sound waves. We jokingly on the boat call it the sand and rock channel because you just watch a screen <laughs> right. and it scrolls and it scrolls and it's sand and rocks and sand right. and rock. And then, um, when and then you, every once in a while something exciting happens. And then when you have an area like in this case where you suspect something, do you send a, uh, like a machine down or do you send actual divers? Because I'm imagining it's pretty deep, right? Yeah, so we send did we send divers down to this target uh, to analyze what was down there. Uh, we dived a couple of targets during this trip. One of them turned out to be Lilene, uh, and we we had four divers diving the wreck, and they did a total of thirteen dives on it, and slowly amassed information until we felt like we could confidently make the identification of the ship. How deep are we talking about, Jennifer? So we're not revealing at this time the exact location and the depth okay. um, because we've been trying to protect the wreck site right now. Yeah, I understand. But it is in deep and uh, dangerous water. I mean, this is diving. Uh, our divers are all technical divers that are used to diving in deep, high current, sometimes rough conditions. Okay. And talk to me a little bit about, um, so when you don't reveal um, location and depth of water is that to protect it's to protect the site but protect the site from who like people who are novice and who want to go out there and um um do it or is it other competitors a little bit of both um you know we've spent a lot of time looking for this wreck um i have a particular passion for this ship because i, I wrote a book about it oh, wow. um we really want to be able to uh to have to to go back to the site fully document it, map it, see what's there, and kind of in a systematic way, go through the wreck site um, and preserve what we can for history. And that you, all you're saying is that it's off the coast of New Bedford. Is that correct? Yeah, it's about two, about 200 miles from New Bedford, which was our starting point. Was okay. New Bedford's about 200 miles from there. All right. So let me talk a little bit about your book and this boat. What, what are you so fascinated about this boat? Why? Why? So the book, my book is called The Adriatic Affair, uh, a, a, a Maritime Hit and Run Off the Coast of Nantucket. And the reason to, that this, this particular shipwreck really captured my imagination is you have a shipwreck, you have a French steamship that collided with an American sailing vessel in the 1850s. In this real period of transition between sail and steam, 
when the countries were just dealing with what happened when ships from two different countries met on the open ocean. So mm. it's a really fascinating time in history. And what makes this story in particular so fascinating is that it's uh, not only a, a shipwreck disaster story, it's a survival story. We have people who survived this disaster. They were on a lifeboat in the North Atlantic in a storm for almost a week. Wow. And then after this, it is after the survivors have been rescued, the story sort of be even begins there. Uh, the American captain ultimately finds his way to France on a regular kind of business run and is arrested in France and put on trial for what happened in the collision with Le Lene. So, th so there's a, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by day and I'm a shipwreck hunter on the weekends. Jeez, so for me, it's really the perfect combination of a shipwreck story and a legal drama that plays out. That is really interesting. I may have to look at your book now. Talk to me a little bit about what the what did the crew on the white uh, on the U.S. vessel what what happened after the uh, impact? So after the impact, um, the Lilayne kept going under her own steam. She was kind of moving by inertia, and the Adriatic, which was the American sailing ship, thought that that because she kept going, that she was fine. They were the smaller ship. They had damage to their bow. Um, so they returned to Massachusetts and didn't stand by to aid the, the Lelaine. And, um, you know, there's there's conflicting stories. Lelaine says that they fired their cannons and sounded their lights and were trying to get their attention. The Adriatic says that they didn't see that. So there's definitely different perspectives on the story. Right. What we do know is that when the American captain returned to Massachusetts, he put his ship in for repairs, but never mentioned that he had had a collision with another vessel. Wow. It was only a week later when the lifeboats were starting to come, the lifeboats started to come back and news of that reached New York and Boston that he finally said, oh yeah, I hit another ship out there. Do you think based on your research and your legal background that, uh, you know, based on what you know, he knew that he had done it and, and kind of just ignored it or, okay, I hit a boat, but the boat kept on going and I kept on going and that's my defense. I think that in any situation like this, particularly collisions at sea, it really is a matter of perspective. And there is a lens through which you can see how he might have believed that the other ship wasn't in peril and that he was in real danger himself of sinking. Um, right. And on the other hand, you can understand how the the, the surviving crew and passengers of Lelaine believe that uh, this person just hit them and left them to fend for themselves. I think like any good crime drama, there's two sides to it and there's right. two sides to the story. It'd be, I think it would be fun if you went to some law school and you had one, you know, one team represent uh, the the U.S. ship and the other one represent the um, the steamship. You know, that would be a, an interesting dynamic. Because as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking if I was a defense lawyer, I have two defenses already in my mind. Mm -hmm. So. Now, if you will, take us on board that steamship. Uh, uh, you know, when people think of a steamship in France, they're thinking the Titanic. What? Tell me who's on board with us. Where are we going? Is this business or pleasure? So it, it was pleasure for most people. This was a passenger steamship on its first voyage from New York to France. And on board were some, some prominent and wealthy cabin class passengers. Albert Sumner, who is the brother of the famous uh, senator from Boston, Charles Sumner, his, he and his family were on board. John Gardner Jr. was on board of the famous Gardner family of Boston. Mm. There were a number of other sort of high profile people on board the ship. Um, and then there were also regular people who were either traveling home to France or seeking passage to France to visit family for a number, you know, people on board for a number of reasons. Right. There was well, a large a company complement of crew as well. Yeah, that's a and that's a that's a top tier kind of a list you're mentioning. Uh, we the Sumner Tunnel in Boston, obviously named after one family, and the Garden Museum after the other. Where was it going? Where were they going? To Le Havre, France. From New York. Oh, okay. From New York to the France. Okay, and this was. Give me the exact date here. They left on November first, eighteen fifty six, and the collision occurred on November second, eighteen fifty six. Wow, that's incredible. How many survivors? So there were 16 survivors. I'm sorry, 18. 18 survivors in all. 18 out of how many people on board? Do you know, give or take? Uh, 132 is the number that I, I go with in the book. You know, yeah. like any 
old story. There are a number of different reports and you kind of have to reconcile them. Uh, that's That was the best number that, that I came up with looking at the multiple reports of the collision, but it could be a few more or a few less, but 132 yeah. people on board wow. and only 18 survivors. Were you able in your book, uh, which I haven't seen yet, obviously, were you able to, are there photos there of what, what it looked like prior to the, the collision? Yes, so we don't have any photos of Lilayne. Wow. The best that we have are photos of some of her sister ships in a later period of history. There are some drawings of her. And actually the book is, it was released for pre-order, uh, but it comes out on February 28th. And it's going to contain an epilogue of our search and discovery mission as well. So there'll well, be underwater great. photos of Lilayne uh, oh, in the great. book as well. So, 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 tell me what's available visualized right now. Are you saving that all for the book uh, launch? No, there's definitely photographs that are available that we've posted online. Okay, you know, so on we this have trip, those. yeah, on this trip, we okay. were really focused on making the identification, which, right. okay. you know, it's very rare to go down and see a name on a ship. It's a painstaking process. Is that so what you, our so photographs the, the, are the a lot of still on it? machinery and engine parts and pieces? Uh, but those are the photographs that we've posted. Yeah, intact or or no? no? No, severely broken up. The North Atlantic is totally inhospitable to shipwrecks. There's storms, currents, fishermen that are dragging nets and gear over wrecks. Um, it really is a bad place to be a shipwreck. Right. Well, I suppose anywhere is a bad place to be a shipwreck, <laughs> but I know true. what you're saying, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this question. Um, we, I thought that you said, um, and I don't want to interrupt you, but um, did you say that you were able to actually uh, find a part of the ship that had its name on it? No, no, no. No, okay. I was saying it's very difficult to find that. So right. we we kind of slowly put the pieces of the puzzle together over those 13 dives to finally on the, the we, we dived in on uh, August 20. 3rd and August 24th. And it wasn't really until the afternoon of the 24th that we felt confident in making the identification. Wow, that's incredible. That's just recently. And can you just give us an idea that uh, if we were to look at a picture, what we would see? Are we, is it kind of like what we see with the Titanic and stuff like that? No, what you'd see is a very buried wreck, very broken apart. Usually with old shipwrecks, and with most shipwrecks, but particularly with very old shipwrecks, the only thing that is surviving is an engine, so big and, and big brass pieces of machinery, most of the rest of it rots away. So you would see down there um, hull plating that is very old and aged. You'd see the engine, which was a very unique engine. Uh, one of the earliest examples of a steam engine, uh, it was a, called a horizontal engine, very rare. Um, that was one of the ways we were able to identify it. Wow, that's and incredible. then you'll also see evidence of sails because this ship will have both an engine and sails. Well, that's cool. Well, that, that well, that's pretty cool. But what about like 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 is it is is it too long in the Atlantic too tough to find? Maybe possibly if you went back down a plate from dinner or anything to that effect. Oh no, not not at all. Like we okay. we find things like that on shipwrecks all the time. On these dives, we were really focused on, less on, on taking things, less on salvaging artifacts, and more focused on gathering the evidence to make the identification. Right. Um, and when we go back, hopefully we would come across artifacts that we could bring up and kind of help connect people to the history of the yeah, ship. Yeah, that's amazing. What a great story. I, 